Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the IRWD and Master Gardeners BA Garden Scene Investigator webinar. I hope you all are all super excited to be here because we are super excited to have you join us. My name is Juan Garcia, and your presenter today is Linda Guinness with the Master Gardeners of Orange County. Um, I am part of the water efficiency team here at IRWD. Before we get started, I would like to share a few housekeeping items with you to remember throughout the event. You will notice that your microphones are already muted. This helps us. This helps to allow our video presenter presentation to run smoothly and to avoid any distractions. We will be sending you all an email, which will include a copy of this presentation and any handouts. There will be a Q and A session at the end of the event, so definitely stick around for that. Myself and other IRWD staff will be monitoring the chat feature, so please submit your questions through the chat function. The best way to do this is to click the drop down arrow in the chat area of your screen. Choose everyone, then submit your questions. By doing this, it helps our team to ensure your questions are collected and answered properly. Should you have any technical issues during the workshop, please contact our help desk line at 949-453-5757. An IRWD representative will be able to assist you. So let's test the chat feature by having everyone type in what community or city you are joining us from. And remember to choose the everyone option when posting your comments. Okay, let's start sharing where we're all from, which will help us out. There you are. Great, fantastic, everybody. It's very rare where we get some people from other states. It's pretty funny sometimes. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. With that said, let's get this presence presentation started. And uh, I would like to present Linda Gennis with the Master Gardeners of Orange County again. Take it away, Linda. Thank you, Juan. Um, okay. I'm not. Uh... <laughs> You're uh, annotating my comments, but I, um, I'm i not able to advance the slides. I don't know what's up with that. Okay, here we go. Uh, my name is Linda Guinness. I'm with uh, UCCE Master Gardeners of Orange County. The UCCE stands for University of California Continuing Extension, uh, which means that you know we're part of a statewide organization and our state is part of a nationwide organization of Master Gardeners. We go through a training program of 50 hours or more. We have more like 70 hours in our training. And then our mission is to provide home gardeners with research-based information. So today we're gonna to talk about being a garden scene investigator. And the reason we taught, uh, selected this for the title of our presentation is that crime shows and police uh, procedurals are really popular on TV and we've seen so many of them. Uh, we kind of, we know what police do when they investigate crimes and we wanna be able to put some of those uh, practices to apply them in our garden. And in fact, it makes it hard on real police because we're so used to seeing things solved so quickly within an hour's show on TV, we expect that to happen in real life. And it's a little more complicated than that. So we'll, um, the main purpose is to help you see your garden a little more closely. So the most important factor in maintaining a healthy garden is the gardener. 
It's not the miracle solution you buy at the store or something that someone advertises on TV. It's you because just by you being out in your garden and observing and seeing what's going on is going to help you decide what needs to be done in your garden. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an entomologist or have a degree. Just using your eyes and seeing what's happening will really help you take care of your garden. Uh, what we hope to learn today is how to make more thorough observations, how to look at things carefully. We know that um, in fictional detectives like Sherlock Holmes, uh, he, what made him stand out from everyone else was his ability to notice little simple details, which sometimes would help solve the crime. So we're going to learn how to look, uh, where to look in our garden and what little things to look for that might help alert us to problems in our garden that we could take care of before they get to be something big and uh, hard to deal with. Also, when we see something in, gar in our garden, how are we going to use the internet to help us? Uh, there, uh, you probably belong to some different uh, Facebook pages or, or groups on the internet where you share information. But you don't always know if what's being shared is something that's really going to work or not, or whether it's a magic solution that someone presents is going to really help your plant or maybe even unintentionally cause some harm. So how do you know what's a trusted resource? We'll talk about that, looking for uh, sources that have an EDU, which means it's an educational organization, uh, plant societies like the Rose Society would be a pretty trusted place to go to for information on roses. Uh, and what to do when you need more help, because uh, as a home gardener, sometimes things are just beyond our knowledge or training. We have training in other areas, but maybe not plants. And uh, what can you do when you need some extra help? And one thing we hope that you will do is come to Master Gardeners uh, through email. We're not out in public a lot these days, but we are just a short email away. So that we know by watching uh, all those uh, shows on TV, the first thing you do uh, when there's a problem is identify the victim. And when you identify the victim, then that really helps narrow down who the culprit could be that causes the problem. Some problems are specific to certain plants. For example, if some of you are interested in uh, butterflies, you know that the monarch caterpillar will only eat milkweed. So if you see a caterpillar on milkweed, you could be pretty sure that it's a monarch caterpillar. If you see a caterpillar on your orange tree, you're pretty sure it's not a monarch caterpillar because they don't eat citrus leaves. That would be a swallowtail. So knowing the name of the plant really helps narrow down things a lot because as we know there's millions of different types of insects. Also, if you know the plant, what you think may be a problem might be part of the normal growth of the plant. Some plants might have uh, bumps on the stems that are part of the normal growth nodes. I had a zucchini once that had some, uh, the big leaves had kind of a silvery part on them and I thought it might be mildew, but it was just the normal way the plant grew. So once I became familiar with that, then I knew it wasn't a problem or anything to worry about. And the problem might be that you have a plant in the wrong place. Uh, if you buy something at a nursery and it's underneath shade cloth, you can be pretty sure you should plant it in a shady place. And if it's out in the open in the sun, then it might like the sunshine better. Or you might put it somewhere where it's uh, underneath the overhang of a roof and it's getting too much water when it rains. Uh, so knowing what the plant is will help you figure out uh, what's going wrong with it. It helps with your care too, knowing the name of the plant will help you uh, know how much to water it, what kind of routine care it might need. It might need pruning, it might need fertilizer at different times of year. It might need to be, if it's a bulb, it might need to be divided, like the bulbs in the picture there. Uh, you dig up and divide them every several years. This is especially uh, challenging sometimes if you move into a house where you didn't put the plants in and the previous homeowners left the plants. Sometimes it's a good idea to take some time and find out what those plants are. You could send us pictures, you could look online, you could take a little piece to a nursery. Uh, when you take a piece of a plant to a nursery, bring it in a plastic bag too, because if it has some kind of pest or something, the nursery people are you know, pretty protective of their stock. They put a lot of money into what's going there. 
and they don't want anything introduced. You could see on this slide here, this is from our IPM website, which I'll be showing you in a little while later, the difference between the pests and problem you could have with different plants. On the left, you'll see the rose, which has a huge myriad of different kinds of uh, pests. There's a, a number of all different kinds of scale it could have, uh, aphids, leaf miners, beetles, and then if you look on the right column there, diseases, a whole big long list of diseases that a rose could have. Whereas on the other side, the sage, there's hardly anything. They are pretty much pest free. Aphids and thrips are the only things that could be on sage. And with my experience, not that often. Just a couple of diseases, and those aren't very common either. And then uh, environmental disorders, you'll find this on just about every single plant, poor water management. No matter what the plant is, poor water management, too much or too little can do in a plant. Then we start examining the victim. And one thing you might notice that's uh, most obvious are holes. The holes aren't always the same. Either you could see um, differences in the picture up in the upper left here. You see the holes are pretty large, and they're right in the middle of the leaf. That hole could be, because of the size of the hole, it might be something with a bigger mouth, like a grasshopper. Uh, could have been eaten by snails, but they usually are a little more raggedy. Um, these holes are, you see, they're a little bit smaller, more irregular, and the culprit there has left a little clue behind of what they are, and that looks like it was left by a snail or a slug. This hole is quite different. It looks like it was made by a hole puncher, and the holes are right on the edges of the leaves. So when you say my plant has holes in the leaves, you see there's a lot of variation in what kind of holes that would help figure out what the pest is that's making those holes. And these are the ones that made the holes. The snail, this is a slug. Slugs and snails are pretty much uh, do the same thing, except slugs, of course, don't have that shell. They make holes in the ground. You might have noticed more snail and slug damage lately because after the rain, a lot of them woke up. They estivate when it's dry. That the Snails go into their shell and they have kind of a membrane that covers them and keeps them moist. And then when it rains, it kind of wakes them all up and then they go out and start eating. This is a looper on a tomato plant. This also has chewing mouth parts. Although we know caterpillars turn into butterflies and moths that don't have chewing mouth parts. When they're juveniles, they do have chewing mouth parts, so they make holes and things. And the round holes that look like they were from a paper punch, those made by the leaf cutter bee. And the leaf cutter bee doesn't eat those uh, pieces of leaf it takes out. It uses the holes, those round pieces of leaf to make a nest. So it will cut around a hole out of the leaf and bring it over to a place, uh, put a lot of them together to make its nest. Other type of leaf damage could be a skeletonized leaf. These are usually made by sawflies or caterpillars. They eat the soft tissue between the veins and don't eat the veins, so you can end up with a leaf uh, that looks like this. This is more common on roses. It's made by uh, what's sometimes called a rose slug, although it's not really a slug. It's the larva of the, um, the now I'm at a blank. I just said it. But it's uh, the rose slug would do that on roses, so that would be you would know immediately if you saw that on a leaf, that's the common pest that would do that. Leaf mining is a little different. Uh, once you see this, it's usually too late to do anything about it because the pest is already in there. It's between the cell layers of the leaf and it's going around eating its way between those cell layers. And anything you sprayed on the leaf would not reach the insect that's inside there. Uh, leaf miners, we are most, uh, familiar with on citrus trees, the citrus leaf miner, but there are leaf miners for lots of different plants. The adult could be a moth, a fly, or a soft fly. They lay an egg on the underside of the leaf. When it hatches, it immediately makes a little hole in the leaf, and then it lives its life eating through the leaf and leaving this trail. And then when it's an uh, adult, it comes out and makes a little cocoon and then turns into the moth or fly that it is in the adult form. 
And some of you mulch the on citrus and then as a leaf will be curled up and you'll see the little webbing from the cocoon there. So even though there, you might see things that spray this or spray that, when the miner's inside the leaf, it's not gonna do any good. The um, only way you could maybe uh, treat this is if you got the spray on the underside of the leaf on the, before the egg hatched. And what you can do if you have a lot of citrus leaf miners is you buy a pheromone trap and you put it, you don't hang it in the tree because that will just attract more of those uh, flies into the tree. You hang it far away from the tree to attract them away from it. Leaf mining doesn't actually kill the tree or plant. It just makes it look ugly. You can just cut those leaves off and uh, not worry too much about it harming the plant. Window painting is also done by uh, pests with chewing mouth parts. You can see the little caterpillar on there. Sometimes they don't eat a whole clear through the leaf. They only eat a few layers of the cells and it leaves this window pane effect. And that could help narrow down to exactly what the pest is by knowing the kind of damage that it's causing. Like a grasshopper wouldn't do that. A grasshopper would just take a big chunk out of the leaf. Notching is something else. Uh, notching could be done by a number of different uh, caterpillars, sometimes other uh, beetles and things like that. They eat out from the edges of the leaf and toward the middle. They don't seem to um, care too much about the veins. Sometimes they'll eat through the veins. Uh, most chewing insects like the softer part of the leaf better. That's why they even attack the young leaves more than the old leaves. Shot holing is kind of interesting because it could be caused by a couple different things. It could be little caterpillars on the underside of the leaves eating small holes, but there's also a fungus called shot hole disease that'll do the same thing and make little holes in the leaves. And you could tell this is from a fungus because it's also on the fruit of this plant. And you could see the uh, fungal, the groups of fungal spores there that have caused the damage. And when we're looking for more clues, besides the actual holes, we're gonna look to see if our perpetrator left behind a clue. And of course, this is a real obvious one. The slime trail, we know, uh, indicates the presence of a slug or a snail. This, these things that look like little miniature hand grenades are actually the frass from a tomato hornworm. And frass is what we call caterpillar poop or insect droppings. And this is right here. One of the most important things we could do is to look on the underside of the leaves. Most insects uh, have not lasted that many millions of years in evolution by being real obvious when they eat. They're not just out where we could see them. You could be standing looking at your garden and because you're looking down on your plants, the leaves may be look, you know, they have holes in them, but you don't see a single insect. And you think, what could have caused that? There's just holes in the leaves and there's no bugs. Well, pick up the leaf and look underneath it. And a lot of time that's where you'll see the problem. This is on a broccoli plant in my yard. And, you know, the broccoli plants are several feet below eye level. I look at them, I see the holes, pick up the leaf, and sure enough, there is a little caterpillar. It's the same color as the, what it's been eating, so it's a little bit hard to see sometimes, but they're, um, this one is you know, probably only half an inch long, very tiny and skinny. When they get big, they're more obvious, but um, it was time to squish this one. I don't like to touch it with my fingers, but I could just fold the leaf over and squish it or find a stick or something. Uh, these caterpillars that you see most commonly if you have a vegetable garden, are laid by, the eggs are laid by little white butterflies, those little cute butterflies you see flitting around. Sometimes they're just all white, sometimes they have a little spot on the upper leaf. Those are um, called cabbage white butterflies, and they do lay their eggs on all kinds of vegetable plants and some ornamental plants as well on the underside of the leaves. So that's where you have to look. Oops. Then there's plant pests that have sucking mouth parts. These kind of pests don't make holes in the leaves, but they leave all kinds of other damage. They're sucking the juices out of the plant. They have piercing mouth parts. Um, one reason these pests could be so much of a problem is because they go from one plant to another, they could spread plant diseases. Uh, chili thrips spread the disease. Um, they originally were on 
uh, found on pepper plants, and that's why they're called chili thrips, not because they come from the country of Chile. Uh, they've been causing a lot of problems in rose gardens now because they like roses as well as chilies. And when the pests uh, feed on one plant that has the disease and fly along to another plant, they spread the disease. Just like you know, mosquitoes spread disease from person to person, thrips could spread disease from plant to plant. Also, in these plants that are sucking the juices from the plant, they can weaken the plant. Um, they produce honeydew as the juices go through their um, digestive system. They excrete honeydew, which ants really like. So ants will come and protect them. Uh, the honeydew is also a place where sooty mold can grow. And you could see this picture of a leaf on a citrus tree. On the underside, there is all this white fuzzy stuff, which could be uh, cottony, cottony aphids, it could be mealybugs, and then there's the black sooty mold that they're excreting. This is uh, an aphid. Aphids come in a lot of different colors. We're more familiar with the green ones, but there's black aphids that go on onions. There's a whole variety of different aphids that go on different kind of plants. Sometimes it's hard to tell in a photo whether something is uh, white fly, sometimes could be fuzzy too, aphids, scale and mealy bugs are fuzzy. But the um, solution for all of them is pretty much the same. So sometimes it doesn't matter a whole lot if you know exactly which one it is. Uh, most of these you could hose off with a strong spray from your garden hose or use uh, horticultural oil. Scale is a little easier to see. Scale is like barnacles uh, of the plant world. So this, and they usually are more on the stems and trunks of things rather than on the leaves. So the scale could be, you could scrape it off with a stick. It's harder to treat with any kind of spray. It doesn't wash off with the hose. Only at certain parts of its life cycle, the baby insects will crawl off uh, to make their own little hard covering, and that's the only time with, uh, any kind of spray would be effective on them. And there's not a picture of thrips here because thrips are really tiny, and uh, we would need a special camera to take a picture of them. This shows sign of the life cycle of when you have uh, sap sucking insects. This is showing it on uh, citrus. Not my drawing. I found this online. I'll confess to that. It's probably from some kids' uh, report at school. Aphid scale, mealybugs, all these sucking insects produce honeydew, which ants like. So the ants will protect them. They'll protect them from uh, ladybugs. We know ladybugs eat lots of aphids, but the ants will help keep the um, ladybugs away. Any other kind of natural predator for these things, will, they'll be protected by ants. And then, of course, we have the sooty mold, mold which grows and uh, which causes other problems. So if you see ants, Growing a lot of ants going up and down your tree trunk. They're not just going up and down for the fun of it. There's probably some kind of sucking insect up there that they're farming. So if you have a problem with any of those sucking insects, uh, they like citrus trees. One good uh, way you can uh, combat that is by keeping the ants away. And you could uh, there's a stuff called tanglefoot. It's very very sticky. Uh, this person is making them. As, uh, I hope they have. Uh, thin gloves on in this picture because you could glue your fingers together with this stuff. I would not apply it with bare hands. Uh, you, could put, uh, you don't apply it directly to the tree trunk. You have to have a strip of uh, some kind of paper. Um, citrus, fortunately, has a smoother trunk than this bumpy one because you don't want gaps in between where the ants could crawl underneath it. That would keep prevent the ants from crawling up the tree and caring for the aphids. And here's, a, see in this picture, this ninth ant is protecting all those aphids from the mean ladybugs that might want to eat them. Another thing you might see on leaves is stippling. Uh, stippling is like little tiny dots. Uh, like if you take an art class, you'll know you would do stippling by pointing the end of the brush down directly down onto the paper to make little tiny dots. This is a tomato leaf. Uh, these are some other kind of ornamental plants. Stippling is also caused uh, by insects that have sucking mouth parts, which would be thrips and one that's not an insect, which is spider mites. It's an arachnid. If you see this on your plants, uh, 
No, someone did not spray some kind of mysterious stuff on your plants. This means you have spider mites. This tomato plant is so infested, it should be cut down, bagged, so they don't spread and then put in the trash. It should not be composted or recycled because you'll be perpetuating the spider mites, which are difficult to get rid of. And then you have herbicide damage. If you use a spray, I don't think people are using this as much as they used to, but uh, we know that if people use a Roundup or any kind of glyphosate product and it's windy, the spray could drift onto other plants where you weren't intending it to go. Um, and it causes uh, deformities on the new growth of leaves. It's especially problematic with roses. It could look very much like chili thrip damage, and it's really damaged because someone was spraying a uh, Roundup on a path near the rose bush. Sometimes the plant will grow out of this as, as the affected parts, if you cut them off, a new growth comes out that's not been affected by the spray, the plant could recover. Discoloration is something else you might see on your leaves. You can see on the leaf on uh, the left here, you can see the veins are standing up very prominently. The discoloration is uniform across the whole leaf. It's not lopsided. This usually points to a mineral deficiency. It could be iron or manganese, depending on what the plant is in the time of year. You could see on the citrus plant, the discoloration, once again, it's pretty uniform. Uh, when it's not uniform, that's a whole different problem. You could see the, where the veins are, it's a little bit green, but the rest of the leaf is yellow. If this was in the summer, I would say, well, that poor plant needs some citrus food. So in the winter time, it's more normal because when the soil is cold, the roots don't take up the minerals from the soil as well. So it's more uh, common for citrus trees to have light, pale leaves in the winter, and then they'll green up when the ground warms up in the summer. And our ground temperatures don't follow along with our air temperatures. So if you have like a hot day in December, it doesn't mean the soil's going to be hotter. The soil temperatures are more uniform from year to year because they're based on how many hours of sunlight that soil is getting, how much sun is actually bearing down upon the ground. So it doesn't vary that much from one year to the next. You know the soil temperature in December is going to be a lot less than the soil temperature in June when we have the most hours of sunlight. Sometimes uh, there's damage that can look very similar caused by two different things. And that's why it's important to know what the host plant is. Now, both the leaves and both these photos, they look like the leaves are kind of bumpy and curled up. The one on the left is a peach tree. And this is called peach leaf curl. It's a fungus. Uh, if you don't strip off all your leaves and do a good cleaning in spring, you can, this can carry over from year to year. So this time of year, January, is perfect time to uh, prune your uh, deciduous fruit trees, except for apricot, <clears throat> where you leave that alone because that's susceptible to other kinds of diseases in the winter. But your peaches and nectarines and plums can all be uh, pruned this time of year. If the leaves haven't fallen off yet, uh, you could strip them off just by running your hand along the, um, the branch from the tip toward the trunk. Well, they'll usually fall off pretty easy this time of year. And this could be controlled by putting on a preventive spray a couple times during the dormant time when there's no leaves present. So there's a peach leaf curl that causes this bumpy distortion, which is a fungus. And this is a Eugenia, uh, called a brush cherry. And this bumps are caused by psyllids, which um, you know are sucking insects. Eugenia psyllids are pretty common for this type of plant. They won't kill the plant. You could just cut it right there where there's no insects yet and then dispose of this bag it. Don't compost it because it has pests on it. But it's really a more uh, cosmetic damage. It doesn't won't kill the tree or cause any serious problems. Then besides we, the insects and arachnids that can come by, uh, I didn't even talk about rats and things. Uh, there's fungus that your plants can get. Fungus, most fungus grows in damp areas except for powdery mildew. So this is rust. 
really common on roses. And you can see once again, the top part, you see some of the damage, but if you really want to see the spores, turn the leaf over and look at the bottom. That's where most of the bad things hide. You could see those spore sacs. Sometimes they can get really large and look like little bumps on the leaf. This is powdery mildew. See, it looks like white powder. And this is the sooty black mold we were talking about earlier on an orange. This is just on the leaf on the plant here. It's no problem. It won't poison the orange. It's still OK to eat. You could just wash your fruit, and it won't harm you in any way. And this is showing the difference between the host plant too, how the same disease could present itself differently depending on what plant it's on. On the rose bush, the powdery mildew is very obviously white and powdery, so it's pretty easy to identify. But on the tomato plant, it's not, it doesn't look quite the same. It's not an obvious white powder. It causes these lesions on the edges of the leaves there. And the solution for that is the opposite of most fungus is, you know, most fungus appears because there's too much water on the leaf. Powdery mildew is one of the few funguses that reproduces when it's dry. So you could hose off the plant in the early morning so it has a chance to dry during the day, and you could hose off a lot of those spores. And then if it persists, if you need a little uh, boost to that, there are other things you could uh, use in a spray. Uh, there are organic things too. You don't have to go into a lot of chemical stuff. Please don't spray your plants with a mixture of baking soda and vinegar. We had a client uh, send in a question to the hotline. So they did that to their hydrangea, and then the leaf looked all terrible. And like, where, where did you get that idea from? <laughs> Please don't do it again because it, the vinegar in there, you know, burned the plants, and it, you're using some kind of baking soda to um, spray on the plants now. Um, Baking soda is uh, sodium bicarbonate. Potassium bicarbonate can have some uh, positive effects on controlling mildew. But the, the baking soda, sometimes, but you have to dilute it down to the proper dilution. So you really need to look uh, at some research to see what it is, not just throw some in water and hope that it's the right thing, because you might end up doing more harm than good. These are harmless fungi. The first one is sometimes called dog vomit fungus. And it's actually a slime mold, not a fungus. Sometimes it'll appear like this. It could be different colors, different shapes, but it's uh, normally is on mulch. And when it mulch is damp and it's just breaking down the mulch, it will dry up and disappear in a few days. You won't, if you saw this in your garden, you can come back a few days later and it would be gone. If you want to, you could throw it away, but it really doesn't do anything. This one is kind of interesting looking. This is called bird's nest fungi. And I have had it once in my yard after a rain. It was growing on the mulch. And it too is just something that is decomposing the mulch, which is what we want to make it usable for the plants. And usually these, um, when the weather gets drier, a lot of these uh, different fungi will just disappear. It's not doing any harm. And it's not growing on the plants. In fact, it's just growing on the mulch. This is a more serious problem. If you have a fungus growing on a tree, that means that there's decaying wood in there because this fungus only grows on decaying wood. So you've got, it's just a symptom of something else that's happened in your plant. It's a disease you might need to call an arborist. Okay, getting away from the leaves and we're looking at trunks and stems, the most common things are holes. You know, holes in a trunk is a lot different than a hole in a leaf. Uh, grasshopper caterpillar is not going to do that. These are caused by boring insects. And boring insects uh, can get uh, make their home in the tree, depending on what type of insect they are. The prolific is shot hole borer, makes little tiny holes in trees, mostly ornamental trees, and then sets up shop in there. And they eat, uh, they eat a fungus called fusarium. They bring it in there, and the fusarium is what kills the tree, not the holes that the borers make, but the fungi it introduces into the vascular system of the tree. This is a problem because, like I said before, you could see there's a lot of dead wood there. And if you've got fungus growing on a tree, it's not really alive anymore. And scale insects also are things that we would see more likely on stems and trunks. 
uh, not so much on leaves of plants. There are many different kinds of scale, armored scale, soft scale, uh, cottony cushion scale. If there's only a couple, you just scrape them off. There's a lot. We'll need to, I'll go into the pest note a little later about how you can treat that. Sometimes if the plant is just covered with them, you'll have to cut it off. There's a scale that's on a puntia leaf, a cactus leaf, that's called a cochineal scale. And that used to be used for red dye. In fact, it's still used for red dye in some things. Uh, the scale is a red color. The, found, the Spaniards found that when you squish it, you could get this red dye. They used it in red dye for fabrics a lot. And they once had a plan to plant a puntia cactus all over and use it to farm this red scale, but it didn't work out too well. But, um, Anyway, that's a positive aspect of scale insects. Now, what if your palms are with a lawn? How could your observation help determine what's wrong with your lawn? Well, this is um, pretty easy to figure out. It's one just one distinct spot. This one even has a getting greener around the edges. And that means someone's pet has used their lawn for its bathroom. So it will it first be uh, kill the grass and then the grass will grow back and it'll get darker because of the nitrogen and the dog's urine. And it will hopefully heal over. If it keeps doing it too much, of course, it's gonna kill a lot of your lawn. Uh, we went right before our open house at South Coast Research and Extension Center. We had a spot like this on our beautiful demonstration lawn, the low water use lawn there. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And because we have a lot of uh, cameras set up, to uh, observe the wildlife around there. We looked at the, one of the cameras that was in the area and found out that a skunk had stopped there the night before and left its mark there. And so that caused a little dead spot in the lawn. On the picture in the upper right here, you can see that's on a slope and that's just caused, the uh, brown spots are caused by the lawnmower going on a slope and sometimes the uh, blades will hit the grass too low. If you cut off too much of the grass at one time, of course, it exposes a brown part underneath. So that's not serious. That'll just grow out eventually. This is a little different. The brown spots are kind of patchy and irregular. They're scattered over a wide area. Um, this could have been dug up. It could be from grubs in the lawn because skunks and raccoons like to eat the grubs. So they'll come out at night and just dig through your lawn to pull those grubs up and leave a big mess and pull the grass out by the roots, which will cause it to get brown. And the grubs, of course, are eating the roots. So that also will kill the lawn. So if you have uh, patches like this, it could be grubs or uh, fungus sometimes. So there's a fairy ring fungus that actually makes a round circle in the lawn. Looks like somebody uh, was playing some, putting out markings for some sort of a game in a circle. But the, if you, uh, there are ways to test for grubs. You could. Uh, flood the part of the lawn with a lot of water and they'll float to the top and you can see how many there are to see if it's a problem or you'll need to uh, get some kind of grub remedy. Now, what kind of tools do you need to be a good uh, investigator in your garden? There's really not very much you need besides just your powers of observation. One thing that could be really helpful is a moisture meter and uh, they're pretty inexpensive. They used to be under $10. I heard now they're up to around 12. They don't have batteries. They work by some kind of um, interaction between the two metals on the tip of the moisture meter. So that once you buy one, you're set. I know IRWD was giving these out a few years ago at a con conference. Uh, this one I bought about 30 years ago. It still works. You don't leave them in the ground permanently. You, um, you put them in the soil, take the reading, and then pick them out and put it in the drawer or something. But, uh, that's a really good idea to see if you're overwatering or underwatering. You also could just stick your finger in the soil. You could um, you get a stick if you have a big tree, as recommended. If you want to know if, if you're irrigating your citrus or not, get a nice um, stiff stick, like a piece of rebar or one of those skinny green sticks you use to stake up plants, and stick it in the ground. And if you can't get it in the ground more than just a couple inches, the ground is too hard and dry. What happened here? Um, my screen froze again. 
So one, I um Hi Linda, looks like you're oh. back in annotate. Okay. I don't want to do that. I don't know how it happened either. There you go. Looks like your your pointer's back. Okay. Yeah, but I'm not oh. uh, I'm not able to advance my slides either. Just exit out again and try resharing your screen. It should be okay. okay. Yeah, just in case. I did that. Um. Anyway, I'll share what was the next slide. I don't know these. Okay. It's just, I don't know why it's frozen. I don't understand what's going on here. Um, but anyway, uh, the- Linda, try, um, just try again to unshare your screen. Okay. Let's see. Okay, now share your screen again. Technology sometimes doesn't always do <laughs> what well, we hope it's going to do. Yeah. Okay, so okay, there's there a presentation go. again. Oh, perfect. Um, the other thing, uh, this just to help you see better is a loop or a magnifying glass. Sometimes if there's something really tiny in the back of the leaf, it'll help you see it a little better. It's not absolutely necessary, but sometimes um, it's a very interesting. Sometimes you could see things that your uh, eyes don't focus on quite as well or, or it will reveal something that you might have thought thought was uh insect or uh, some kind of problem it turns out to be just some kind of odd mark on the leaf and there's not an insect there at all uh, then we look at the scene of the crime besides the plant itself what's going on around the plant what does the soil look like um, you could see this picture was sent to us by uh, someone on the Hotline, you could see they want to know what was wrong with their palm tree well look at the soil around there it looks parched it's the palm trees don't need lots of water, but they do need some water. It's very dry there. There's no sign of where any irrigation is. Um, it's up against a fence, so hopefully the leaves are tall enough that they're getting sun exposure. We'd want to know about the irrigation. Uh, if it's on a slope, some nice plants on a slope, the water, you might think you're watering enough, but the water's all running downhill and not getting to the roots. You might want to know about the rainfall total, if it's happened recently, if there has been uh, no rain for a year. Uh, what the temperatures are like, excessive heat, and the appropriateness of the plant for the location. If someone was planting this, had a Mexican fan palm, and they planted it up in Big Bear, that might not be such a good idea. Palm Springs, much better. Uh, there is such a thing as too much mulch. This mulch is, it's a very fine mulch, and it's planted right up against the tree trunks. A bigger, chunkier mulch, it doesn't really matter so much if it's up against the trunk, but for this fine mulch that can to mat and cause a lot of moisture, it's really, sh you should leave a little space around the trunk of a tree so it doesn't get, uh, you don't end up getting uh, root rot there. And also bark mulch is really incongruous underneath uh, succulents. These all look like agaves here and they'd probably be better off with some kind of rock mulch, something that looks more natural to their natural habitat. Agaves don't actually grow places where there'd be a lot of bark or leaves on the ground. And water problems could be uh, broken irrigation. Uh, many people have their irrigation set up to go off while they're still asleep in bed early in the morning, which is good. You have less evaporation then. But if something's broken, you might never see it. Um, I know I used to talk, take my dog for a walk in the neighborhood across the street, and someone had a broken sprinkler head, and she knew she could stop there and get a drink of water because there always was a little puddle underneath that particular sprinkler head, even hours later or like my neighbors who spray all the cars in the street with their sprinklers. Uh, in the other picture, you could see the person has put a nice uh, soaker attachment on the end of their hose. The problem is they put it right up by the tree trunk. We don't water trees at the trunk. The roots that take up the water extend out farther than the branches extend. So all the roots that are taking up water for this 
poor little citrus tree here are way out around the edges here and not by the trunk. You're putting all your water down right there at the base of the trunk here, inviting uh, crown rot or root rot. Sometimes there's not enough water. You can see on this lawn, it uh, just is too dry. It's not been getting irrigation. If you have a sprinkler system on and you're not sure if it's working, you can do what's called the can test. Uh, you take little cans, like the size of tuna cans or cat food cans, space them out evenly around your lawn and put on the sprinklers for a few minutes. And you'll be able to see if certain spots in the lawn are getting lots of water and other areas maybe not getting any at all. Then there might have been a change in the environment that affected your plants. See this, uh, in this scene, this tree is being removed, the limbs being sawed off there. And all these plants planted near the pool that were once in total shade are not going to be in bright sun. So that could affect their growth too. They might, uh, they might be plants that aren't well adapted to that change. Could be not even in your yard, but in a neighbor's yard. Uh, I have a friend whose uh, neighbor to the west of her had a huge ficus tree, which shaded a lot of her yard from the afternoon sun. Well, the people sold the house and new people came in and had the ficus removed. And all of a sudden, the plants like fuchsias and begonias that were doing well in the shade were exposed to full afternoon sun. So she had to make some changes in her landscaping. And shadows change at different times of year, too. So we can't you know, go out in one day and say, oh, this is a nice sunny spot, and it's going to be sunny all the time. I made that mistake myself when I put in this vegetable garden at the side of my house because it was in the... June probably, and I thought, oh, this is a nice sunny location. I put in my square foot garden. Everything was growing great. I had lots of tomatoes and green beans and squash and all kinds of stuff here. And then when I wanted to put in some fall plants, I come out and I notice the shadow is all the way over to the side and the whole bed is in the shadow of my house. And the shadow goes all the way up to the block wall fence in the winter time. So I ended up taking this whole thing and moving it to another part of the yard because the shadows do change a lot. You look for where the trees are, the shadows from your home or uh, fences and things will change from uh, December to June. There'll be quite a difference. This shows even the, in the daytime, this is the vegetable garden at the Santa Ana Zoo. And there's, in the morning, there's a jacaranda tree planted here and some of these beds are partly in the shade, but in the afternoon, in October, they're in full sun is great for vegetables. And we mentioned the weather. We had a lot of rain in December, which was great. I hope we turned off your sprinkler system for a while because we had plenty of water. That could affect your plants. Some things might be in low areas. I've lost some uh, low water use plants because they were in low areas and get just got drowned when it rained. High temperatures, we got a lot of questions in on the hotline in the summer about certain plants getting leaves all brown and fried looking. Well, it was right after we had a very unusual hot spell that lasted for several days. Wind can cause damage, uh, especially if you have a banana tree, the leaves will just get totally shredded when it's windy out. And hail, we don't always, it doesn't happen very often, so we don't think about this. And I thought, oh cool, there's hail, I'll go take a picture of the hail. And then these are uh, epidendrums. A couple days later, they all had little spots on the leaves from where the hail had hit the leaves because the cold temperature of the hail did not agree with that plant. And this is a picture that someone sent in and wondering why their citrus leaves are so yellow. And I'm thinking, you know, there's no insects around anywhere. And they didn't change how they were taking care of the plant. But we did notice one thing. Uh, upon closer inspection, that lawn looked really perfect. And on closer look, we could see it's not really lawn, it's artificial turf. Well, they had just had artificial turf put in before they start having this problem with the citrus tree. And as you mentioned before, those feeder roots from the citrus tree would probably be completely under this whole area that's covered with this artificial turf now. How are they going to fertilize a citrus tree when they have this plastic grass on top of it? And we don't know if it's a permeable uh, grass or not, or how permeable it is and how, you know, the water, you can't just water around the trunk. So probably was not a good idea to put a lot of artificial turf right underneath the fruit tree. Then when we get to the suspects, we have to, you know, we actually see the suspects in action. Then we can, you know, go on Google or 
look up our IPM website and say, this is the test, what do I do about it? Um, and that's why it's important to know the host plant. This, uh, there's a lot of orange and black bugs in the world that look very much alike. These happen to be on milkweed seeds, and they are milkweed bugs. And they're doing what you think they're doing, and they do that all the time. That's why there's so many of them. You could see that just knowing a bug is orange and black or reddish orange and black uh, doesn't always help a lot. These bugs are all orange and black, but they're very, they're all true bugs. You could see by they have kind of a, if you look closely, there's kind of an X on the back where the wings fold over. It means they're true bugs, not beetles. This one is a box elder bug, and you would find that on the box elder plant. Uh, these are all sucking insects. They like seeds, and they'll suck on the juices they like to get at the seeds of the plant. Sometimes other parts, too. This one is called a red-shouldered bug. It does pretty much the same thing except as the box elder bug, except it goes on a variety, a wider variety of species of trees, not just the box elder. This is a new uh, Fairly new pest. It was first found in California in 2009. And this is called a red bug. They didn't go too far in thinking of a name of that. And you could see this has this uh, inverted triangles and these two dots here. It also uh, goes for weeds. This one goes mostly on dry weeds and it does reproduce rather rapidly. Uh, its impact on our landscape isn't really fully known yet, but it's been seen in a lot of parts of California. And this one that has the black stripe across it is a milkweed bug. There's a large milkweed bug and a small milkweed bug that have slightly different markings. And they are not exclusive to milkweed, but they pretty much are on milkweed. If you see these on your milkweed plant, uh, don't worry, they won't hurt the caterpillars. If you want to save the seeds, you might not want so many of them because they will go after the seeds of your milkweed plant. And they're pretty much all over the place. Uh, they're very common. Size matters too, because we have, sometimes people will uh, contact our hotline and say, oh, I have Japanese beetles, what am I gonna do about it? In California, the CDFA, which is the people who produce this photo, are very good about keeping Japanese beetles out of California. They're a really big problem on the East Coast, but not so much here. What we're probably seeing are the green June beetles, they're sometimes called fig beetles. Uh, they're huge compared to the Japanese beetle. They're also, kind of iridescent. They're easy to catch because they fly really slow. You probably hear them banging into your windows in the summertime. They like, uh, they'll eat fruit on your trees, peaches, plums, all that kind of stuff. But their uh, larvae are really good composters. So if you see big grubs in your compost bin, they're probably from this green June beetle. So if you keep them confined in the compost, they're doing a great job before you're breaking down the materials in there. But if you have fruit trees, you might not want these big June beetles flying around. Okay, when you uh, are looking to identify a plant, the flowers are usually a big clue. So if a plant's not flowering, sometimes you might have to wait. Uh, this plant, if I didn't know what it was and I had to look it up, uh, I would see it has five petals. It attracts flies, which is pretty unusual, and it has hairy, hairy petals, which is also pretty unusual. So it's easy to identify as a stapelia. This is a plant, oh, we saw something similar to that on Balboa Island. I was out for a walk with friends and we went, well, what is that plant? And so I just Googled, uh, you know, big shrub, uh, pink flowers like upside down hydrangeas, because it does look like a hydrangea. And I found that it was called a dumbaya. If you want to identify a plant, notice the leaves too, how the color of the leaves, how they're arranged on the stem, whether they're a compound leaf or a simple leaf. If you're looking at trunks, look for distinctive features. On this trunk, it's those big thorns in the bottom. That's the silk floss tree. Well, that's a pretty easy one to identify. In an unknown tree, this is from in front of my house. In the wintertime, there's no way to really tell what that is. There's no identifying features on that tree. So if you wanted to identify it, you'd have to find different times of year. This is what the seed looks like. Um, and it has the little panicles, the seeds. It's deciduous, what color the leaves turn in the fall. And by collecting a lot more information, I was able to find out it was a Chinese tallow. Sometimes your city will have a list of uh, trees they planted. 
It didn't do well for me though, because uh, the city usually lists only the trees they're currently planting. And since they discontinued planting this tree, because it's lifting up the sidewalks all over the place, uh, that wasn't on their list anymore because they weren't using it. Okay, and then we're going to see, um, okay, when you have a problem, going to be your detect detective and say, I have this problem, and what can I do to prevent it? Well, it's only on a tomato plant. It's not on all my tomato plants. It's only on just one tomato plant. They're all getting plenty of sun. I don't see any insects present, and I water once in a while. That's my habit. So or not, it's not a habit, which is the problem. So I would go to IPM. I'll show you this website again if you don't get it copied down. It's basically, if you do IPM, you see a and you'll find it. It's easy to find. Then I would go to the home, garden, turf, and landscape pests. Uh, there's, you can see a lot of information here. If you look at this website later on, uh, on your leisure, you can see there's a pest note library, there's videos, there's plant problem diagnostic tool. There's more about wildlife, how you could tell whether there's a rat or a raccoon in your yard. So, but I want to find out about this vegetable. So I'm going to go down here, pests in garden and landscape, and there it says vegetables. And there it says tomato. And then there's all, unfortunately, a giant list of different things that could go wrong with tomatoes. I don't think it's an insect. I didn't see any. It doesn't look like, I don't know if it's a disease because it was only, it's only on one plant. And there's other plants that are the same that don't have it. Maybe it's an, maybe it's an environmental disorder. And I could see this one called blossom end rot. Well, it does look rotten and it is at the blossom end of the plant. So I'll look that up. And sure enough, this matches what I have on my plant. And then it tells me what to do about it. So um, I won't make you read that tiny print, but um, blossom end rot, you might see things where you know throw Epsom salts on your plant or put aspirin tablets in the hole before you plant it. That's really doesn't have anything to do with blossom and rot. It's irregularity in the moisture. It's because I don't have a regular watering schedule. If uh, the ground gets really dry and then really wet, it affects the roots uptake of calcium. And that's why you'll see it in the cells at the bottom of the plant where the weight of the tomato is pressing don't hold up the weight of that tomato, which is why you don't see blossom and rot on little cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes because the fruit is just too small. It's more common on larger tomatoes and also more common early in the season when the ground is uh, not as warm and the tomatoes aren't taking up as much nutrients. And there's no nothing you could spray on it. If the plant isn't completely rotten, you can cut that off and it's still good to eat. Okay, this will be in the handout that Ron will send you some really good uh, Sources of information, I talked about that at the beginning. Do not just take anything off any website or chat group that you don't know where it's coming from. A lot of these will be from, uh, because we live in California, from UC a &R. I heard Juan mention there were some people from out of state. Uh, every state has a master gardener program, so you can find your state's master gardener program, and then your county will have a program. Uh, some counties are combined with other counties, but. There's a lot of good ones out there, uh, Purdue, Clemson, uh, Texas A&M. We get a lot of information from them, UFL in Florida. What we have for trees, select trees really good. That's from Cal Poly, which is a school that has agricultural programs. California Rare Fruit Growers is really a good place to find information about food, especially the unusual ones. And then our own website, MG Orange is uh, another source of information. And this, once again, if you wanted to see this IPM website, this is where we get the answers when you um, send us questions to the hotline. A lot of our answers come from here. If it's not something the University of California has researched, we'll go to other sources like um, plant societies or the CFRG. And then uh, before I leave, I wanted to tell you about this one thing. ACP is a this Asian citrus psyllid that spreads a disease called HLB, and they're working on cures for that, but there still is no cure. There's a large part of Orange County is in quarantine, which is why you can't buy citrus trees in a lot of uh, nurseries that used to sell them. The leaf discoloration is a little different than the nutritional leaf discoloration because it's irregular. 
could see both sides of the leaf are not the same. Uh, the discoloration crosses the veins. The veins don't stand out in this area. You can see them very slightly, but the yellow blotch is very irregular. And HLB is a virus, which is you know, completely different than a nutritional deficiency. And just like people, viruses are a lot harder to treat than bacterial infections. So they have a website where you could find out more. You could see the quarantine map and it tells you what you can do, uh, what you can do for your tree to help prevent it, which is basically to kill the psyllids off because the psyllids are what's spreading the disease. So that is an easy one to find too. Uh, it's just, if you look up ACP, um, University of California, you'll find this website. And there's our hotline email and our website address once again. So uh, if you copy, I know it's an, I don't know how we got such a humongous long email address, but that's what we're stuck with right now. So it's University of California Cooperative Extension Orange County Master Gardener Hotline. But uh, if you go to the website, there's a link to it, so you don't have to write that all down. And we have any time for questions. Thank you, Linda. Thank you everyone for joining us. You know, Linda, I did not, we did not get any uh, questions in the chat feature, but I'm sure if, um, if you have any questions, you do have the email to send them to, and you can also email us at rwd at, at askquan at irwd.com. IRWD Oh, here, here's a question, Linda. Um, any advice on how to get rid of green June beetles? Um, keep your garden clean from the you know place where they lay their eggs, which would mean if there's fruit that's fallen off the ground, clean that up, get rid of it. Don't leave it laying around on the ground. Uh, they do like compost, so they'll lay their eggs in there. And usually you, uh, I don't think there's any sprays we could put on, but a lot of people will bag their fruit. There's little mesh bags you could buy to put over individual fruit. That also helps keep the rats from eating it too, because rats sometimes will do a lot more damage than the, the fig beetles. The fig beetles usually wait for something else to make the first hole. They don't make yes. the first hole themselves. So they'll, they'll come after something else makes a hole, whether it be a, maybe a rat takes a bite out of it or some of these birds will peck at fruit. So the mesh bags, a lot of people have found the mesh bags very effective. Um, also, if you have fruit trees that ripen at a different time of year than when their uh, population is out. I have a couple of fruit trees. I have an aprium and a nectoplum, and they both ripen a little earlier in the summer when they're not, the fig beetles aren't around. So I pretty much escape that damage. By the time the fig beetles are buzzing around, all the fruit's gone. And of course, they do like figs. But I'm sure we have a pest note on that. Okay, let's see. We have another question here. Let's see. Oh, people are typing them in. Great. Um, any advice? Uh, let's see. Um, is there a way to prevent thrips on roses? Um, yes, it involves, you can't really prevent them, but you have to like spray and kill them off when they're there because the spray has to actually touch the little bodies. Um, you have to alternate between two different types of spray. There's been some changes in the methodology. I know the um, Rose Society has some information. We were doing alternate sprays of uh, spinosad and a horticultural oil um, alternate every 10 days during the period when we notice damage. Uh, you have to alternate sprays, not use the same thing all the time because they build up immunity really quickly. So you can't keep using the same thing. And of course, if you see, uh, sometimes by the time you see the damage, it's, you know, they're already gone and moved on somewhere else. Yes. Also be careful that it's not Roundup damage because they look, uh, looks very similar to Roundup damage. The, uh, the buds will be really tiny uh, and the leaves will be really like, uh, almost like a miniature rose on a regular rose bush and kind of distorted too. We had a problem with that at the Rose Garden Heritage Museum and we did, uh, alternate spraying uh, in the evening when there's no bees around because we don't want to kill the pollinators. Okay. Yes, uh, somebody asked if the presentation will be online. Yes, we're getting the presentation once it's downloaded, we will be posting it online. Uh, there is a, a last year's version as well. 
uh, which is very informative, but this it'll be replaced by this this year's presentation. It's, it's been updated a little bit. Um, we had more on plant identification before, but since we started doing this about four years ago, I think the plant apps that are out there are much improved than what they used to be. And yes. I just wanted to caution people, if you use a plant app to identify something, always double check it by looking up the name of the plant and seeing more pictures of it to make sure, to verify that you got the right answer. Because you know, your plant app ID is only as good as the picture you provide. And then there's also some plants that are very similar. So always double check when you get uh, an ID from a plant app. Okay, let's see. We have an we have another question here. Um, we are in Irvine and live in a hilly area. It has been difficult to grow uh, to grow plants. The area is too rocky. Any guidance on how we can have a backyard garden thrive? Thank you. Um, I would send in a question to the hotline because that's pretty involved. You can uh, do terracing. Uh, there are certain plants that are better for slopes if you just want to ground cover. Uh, if you want to put in a tree, you definitely will have to terrace, uh, do some terracing so the you have a place for the roots to get up a, a water. But uh, even in the Sunset Western Garden book, there's a section on plants for slopes. As mm -hmm. far as the rockiness of the soil, you might be um, better off, you know, sticking to succulents, and because uh, those are those aren't picky about soil. There's different plants that are. Uh, more adapted to that. So I would send the question to the hotline because that's something that someone would sit down and do some research on and give you uh, an answer that more than just off the top of my head. Great. Um, can you back up one slide, Linda, so we can have that email up again? And the, uh, um, let's see if we, uh, there we go. And let's see, we have another one. Let's see. What, um, oh, what's a good plant app to use? I don't know. I don't use them, but. Linda, do you know any of the plant apps? Um, I don't use one. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there, there's a Google one that's supposed to be pretty good. There's uh, iNaturalist. Mm, yes, uh, some true. people like that one. But uh, whichever one you use, just you know, be sure to once you get the ID, look up the plant online, and then uh, that'll help you out seeing if the the um, app identified it correctly. And there's another question. The last question is how and when do you prune roses? I mean, it could be, yes. It could be right now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Southern California, we have a lot more leeway. Uh, usually rose pruning is, you know, a lot of what we read is directed for places where it snows in the winter or gets really cold and the roses freeze. So I sometimes prune them kind of late. I had one I did, you know, this time of year and I didn't get around to doing the other rose bush till later on. Um, but the important thing when you're pruning is, Rose trees are a lot, you do a lot of the similar things you do with some fruit trees. Uh, we don't need to take them way down to six inches from the ground like they do in the east or you know, northern areas. You could cut them down by only about a third to half of what their height is. You don't need to bring them down super low. Uh, get rid of all the, any twigs that are skinnier than a pencil, anything that's crisscrossing. Important thing to do is to have air air be able to flow through the plant because that really cuts down on your pests and diseases and air can move through there. It's when it gets really uh, crammed up and dense, that's when those mites and everything can, those insect populations will grow. Uh, and strip the leaves off too and rake up the ground because if you've had rust or anything like that, those spores are on there. So uh, you could pull the leaves off by running your hand backwards. <laughs> Watch out for those thorns. Wear, wear leather gloves when you do this. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, you know, it's there's look for the where the little buds are. You'll see the little red bumps on the roses. You want them to be facing out so the branches go out. You, it's called the vase shape, so it's you know smaller in the bottom and widens out toward the top. And if you make a mistake, don't worry about it. The rose won't care too much. You can yeah. Just correct that later on. So don't stress on it. There's not like this is the one only way to prune a rose bush. Uh, and uh, you don't really need to fertilize it until the new uh, growth starts coming out. So you can kind of leave it. Um, usually what we do is we don't don't deadhead starting in November. We just leave the rose hips on for the plant to kind of store up its energy and stuff. But the, with our weather here, sometimes it never stops producing roses. I have a rose that just keeps going and going and going. And, uh, you know, that's the one I pruned. I think I waited until March to prune it last year. But... Uh, 
sometimes they start slowing down and then you get it down to bare, uh, refresh, put some nice fresh mulch underneath there. And then once it starts to um, get little bumps and butt out, then start your feeding probably every quarterly. Okay, we have time on your package directions, it'll tell you what to do. If it's yeah. in a container, you usually use a liquid fertilizer. If it's in the ground, you use a granular. Okay, we have time for, let's see, we have a, one more. Let's, let's do one more. I think um, well, one person's asked about how does, what's the best way to save fruits from predators, which is uh, something I struggle with as well. Yeah, it was the, usually the mesh bags, or if, if the predators are rats and they put out rat traps. Uh, yeah. Snap traps are considered more humane. Uh, there's a lot of um, the anticoagulant, uh, the rat poisons. Uh, there's some pushback on that because if the rat, the rat will crawl off somewhere else and die, and then some other animal will, a predator will eat that, and then it will be introduced in the food chain and work its way up until the, um, like hawks and owls and things like that. So the yeah. snap trap, uh, the traps that are approved by the state of California are very are considered humane because they do it very quickly the rat is like instantaneously killed and doesn't have a long period of suffering that's why glue traps don't use the glue traps that is just terrible for then you've got the rat stuck to this piece of cardboard and it just stays there yeah okay last question everybody um, if you have any further questions please email uh, the uc master gardeners there at the hotline email Last question is, is it best to pick all the lemons on a tree or pick when needed? When should I prune? Oh, pick when needed. Um, lemons hang on the tree uh, pretty long. Different fruits hang on the tree longer than other fruits. Um, but no, you don't have to harvest the whole tree all at once. They'll last pretty long on the tree. Another interesting thing about lemon is, you know, if you have oranges, the rats will eat the fruit out and leave the hollow uh, rind there and that's when you know you have rats if you see those uh, hollowed out oranges they do the opposite with lemons they eat the peel off and leave the fruit there so if you see like a lemon with no peel hanging on your tree that means a rat was there and ate the peel off uh, but no you don't have to um, pick them all at once citrus trees don't need yearly pruning like the deciduous fruit trees uh, you could prune them when they don't have any fruit on them and that's basically to uh, take off any water sprouts, which are the long shoots that sometimes come up, grow straight up, and they grow really much faster than the rest of the tree. They won't produce fruit. Uh, make sure you're not getting sprouts from the rootstock down at the bottom. And then if it's just too dense, you could take out some of the, if there's any dead twigs, cut those off or anything that's um, too dense in the middle. But no, they don't require the yearly pruning like we do with our peaches and plums and so on, or apples. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, once again, for joining us. Linda, always a great presentation. And um, if you need, uh, if you want to visit, we do have uh, various other webinars that have been pre-recorded from, uh, from our past uh, series. You can find them at Rightscape at IRWD.com website and uh, on the Rightscape.com website page. Under the events and classes page, yeah, you'll find a link there to all the past workshops that have been pre recorded. And thanks once again for joining us. We will be having a workshop next month. Uh, it's going to be covering our uh, various turf removal program. It's going to be called uh, Naturally Beautiful Yard. Uh, please join us for that webinar, which is in February. Once again, thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, everybody.